Hello, everyone. I'd like to talk about uh, our work on non-symptotic analysis for non-parametric testing. So here, there are two keywords. One is non-symptotic, one is non-parametric. So why non-symptotic? Let's motivate this from this toy example of uh, conducting statistical inference uh, for the population mean of a distribution family. So when xi, they have a known distribution as normal, uh, we can achieve that by creating a confidence interval based on the sample mean, which has precisely 95% coverage probability. However, when the distribution of xi is unknown, we don't have uh, a closed form expression for the uh, distribution of the sample mean. So we have to go to the asymptotic regime by approximately uh, compute this probability via the central limit theorem. And you can see here the price is uh, the asymptotic val uh, validity, which means it's only true when the sample size is large enough. So, so that means if I give you a small sample size, uh, you cannot uh, confidently tell me that how precise this procedure is. So this uh, is where the non-symptotic analysis kicks in. Uh, the idea is very simple. We just want to uh, um, develop some constant inequality for the random variable x of interest. So in the previous two example, the random variable would be just a sample mean. And uh, the advantage of using constant inequalities versus an asymptotic type analysis is that this uh, guarantee is true for any sample size. So as example, we can using the Hoffling inequalities uh, for the case when we would like to uh, conduct inference about the population mean um, for using the sample mean. So let's try to uh, look more closely of how good this uh, non-asymptotic way of uh, conducting inference uh, compared to the asymptotic approach. So when uh, we have normal uh, observations, uh, in this case, the asymptotic approach is actually uh, exact. And if you look at the non-asymptotic intervals, you can see that it'd be sharp in the rate in terms of dependence on the sample size, but it's not sharp in terms of the constant, which means uh, this procedure will be a little bit more conservative. And similarly for the Bernoulli case, uh, also uh, the uh, sample mean in this case does not have a closed form expression, but we can still get a asymptotic intervals, uh, which has constant uh, 0.98. Also, if we plug in uh, the numbers in the Hovling inequality, we can get a different constant, which is again, larger than the asymptotic counterpart. Now let's try to uh, compare those uh, two uh, uh, cases via simulation studies. For the Gaussian case, again, because everything based on asymptotic analysis is precise. So you can see that the interval from the non-symptotic analysis is wider and the coverage is larger than the nominal level. So you can think of the non-symptotic based analysis tends to be more conservative. But if you look at the Bernoulli example where the uh, uh, distribution of the sample mean is not uh, precisely normal. So you can see here, if the sample size is small, the procedure based on the asymptotic analysis is not uh, satisfactory because it has a coverage probability way below the nominal level, which is bad if we want to have some safe guarantees. However, for the uh, non-asymptotic based approach, although they still tend to be conservative, but they always, uh, they always have value that is above the nominal levels, which is safe to use. And here is some uh, selected review of some uh, non-symptotic based analysis uh, for statistical inference in some uh, simple examples, including some extension of the sample mean problems to high dimensional as well as some parametric um, um, problems. So here in this talk, we'll mainly focus on uh, a non-symptotic analysis uh, for non-parametric models, uh, which is not uh, uh, covered in prior literature. So to be more precise, we will, we will focus on the regression models uh, where, we have, where we have some response Y and some feature uh, XI. And we would like to do a hypothesis testing problems, which means we would like to test the null hypothesis of whether this regression function F belongs to some pre-specified family F0. So for example, in a case of simple hypothesis, uh, the F0 just contains one component. If we choose F0 to be zero, this reduced to a independence test of whether Yi has depend is dependent on the feature Xi. 
And in the case of composite hypothesis, uh, we may choose the F0 to be the space of all linear functions uh, where this hypothesis testing problem uh, boils down to the problem of testing whether y has a linear dependence on the features. So as a common strategy uh, to uh, do hypothesis testing, we usually come up with a test a statistic t, then based on the uh, distribution of tn, we can find a some cutoff kind of value tn uh, so that we would like to reject this uh, the null when this test statistics is uh, larger than this cut of values. And usually how to determine this cut of values is based on a asymptotic approximation to the distribution of TM in order to control the type of an error, which is the probability of wrongly rejecting the null when the null is true. So uh, let's motivate our uh, test statistic in this case uh, from a smoothing spline estimate, which is can be obtained uh, in this way as a uh, special case of the uh, for more general kernel re regression estimate. So here uh, we choose the reproducing kernel hydro space uh, as the MS order sublet space, and the, the corresponding uh, RQH uh, norm, which is uh, we call it the H norm here, is given by the integration of the square of the m's order derivative. So for a function that is less smooth, this penalty um, term will be larger. Uh, in order to uh, introduce our result, let's try to uh, 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 introduce some more notations. So we use k to denote the corresponding kernel functions. And also we use rho and the phi to denote the corresponding eigenvalue and eigenfunction pair. So for sublet space, the um, eigenvalue has a polynomial decay, depending on the smoothing level. Also, it's good to induce another related norm uh, as a sum of the L2 norm plus the uh, norm of the RQHS. So as you can see, endowed with this new inner product, uh, the sublet space will be still a reproducing kernel Hilbert space. And we will, we, the main purpose of introducing this new RQHS HS is that the corresponding kernel function will be uh, will play a very very important role in order to characterize the uh, random fluctuation of the kernel smooth uh, the smoothing spline estimate. So let's uh, uh, start from a simple uh, statistics, which is simply uh, the norm uh, of the estimate minus the hypothesis f zero. So in this case. In order to determine the uh, corresponding kind of values, we can uh, we developed the a concentration inequality for this uh, Tn, where in this case the typical devi uh, the deviation constant Dn uh, is composed of two terms. The first term uh, depends on the penalty parameter lambda is uh, caused by the uh, the bias due to pe uh, penalization, and then the second term uh, is caused by the random fluctuation due to the sample size. Now you can see that from this result, uh, the uh, estimator is not uh, is biased, which the bias is uh, can be characterized by a linear operator uh, p lambda. So if we use this lemma to determine the cut of values, uh, then we can derive the so-called mini uh, the minimal separation rate, which uh, is roughly speaking uh, can be. Understand uh, can be understood as the detection boundary in a sense. What is the smallest smallest uh, signal strength so that you can detect it? In our case, which the would be the smallest difference between the true regression function and F zero, so that you you will um, correctly reject a null if the alternative is true. And as a sanity check, we uh, we can compare this uh, separation rate uh, with the minimax optimal separation rate of hypothesis testing in a symptotic sense. As you can see, in this case, uh, the uh, minimum exception rate for this procedure is not optimal. Uh, actually, this rate is the same as the minimax estimation uh, rate. And we know that usually the detection problem is uh, an easier task compared to the estimation problem. So that's why uh, the minimum exception rate is usually smaller than the, uh, the usual estimation minimax rate. So therefore, uh, uh, it might be uh, that our statistic itself is not uh, does not capture enough structure to get the optimal rate, or it's because of, of our analysis. Uh, 
So it turns out that uh, in this case, both of them matters. So this leads to our main contribution, which is a more refined second order uh, constant inequality for the test uh, statistics, where we would like to incorporate both the bias term as well as a leading stochastic fluctuation term into the construction of the test uh, statistic. So correspondingly, we uh, have this uh, refined concentration inequality uh, for this uh, new statistics. As you can see that now the typical order of the uh, deviation it will be smaller than the previous deviation bound dm because now you have a, an extra term of that is inverse proportional to the square root of sample size, which makes this approximation to be more uh, precise. So again, we can uh, use this as our test of statistics, but here the problem is that this statistics actually depends on the error epsilon i that's not observable. So then uh, the idea is we can somehow replace this one by taking the expectation. So this leads to uh, another uh, test of statistics that we would like to use as this TN tilde. So in practice, uh, in order to uh, construct this uh, test statistic, we can replace the second term i minus p lambda f0 by a noiseless version of the smooth thing spline estimator, which replaced the response y with just f0 at xi and the null. So this will be the result about the type 1 and type 2 error control uh, for this new uh, procedure. Uh, as we can see here, this TN tilde specifies the correct cutoff values if we want to control the type 1 error to be uh, within alpha. And also it uh, gives you a type 2 error control, which is the uh, probability of uh, not rejecting the null when the alternative actually is true. So this can be used to determine what's the power of the test in terms of the separation rate. So here, the separation rate uh, will be composed of uh, three terms. So the first two terms depends on lambda and the sample size, uh, and the third term depends on the type of two error control. Now, in order to uh, maximize the power of the test, it is, is the same as uh, minimizing the uh, separation ra uh, radius. So uh, again, we can do a sanity check um, of this new procedure by compare, uh, by compare the uh, optimal separation rate, uh, rate with the minimax separation rate by uh, pick the best possible uh, tuning parameter lambda. So now you can see because of this uh, refined um, uh, uh, structure and the result, we can achieve the minimax separation rate um, of non-parametric testing. And uh, as another byproduct of, of our procedures, uh, we our result actually leads to a non-synthetic procedure of selecting the regularization parameter lambda by empirically minimizing a plug-in version of the separation function row. And in this work, we also consider some other extensions uh, from simple hypothesis to composite hypothesis. Also, we consider uh, some extension from the smooth thing spline estimate to the more general kernel ridge regression estimate, uh, which where the uh, minimax separation rate, uh, rate is determined by the decaying rate of the eigenvalues of the corresponding kernel function. Also, we can uh, consider some other extension beyond the regression problems, such as classification. Uh, also, we did some uh, simulation comparison uh, of our method with some asymptotic based approach, such as uh, penalized likelihood ratio test, as well as some other um, approach of selecting the tuning parameters, such as by generalized cross validations. So, due to time constraint, I will not uh, dive into those results, and they are all in the paper. So, uh, I just uh, want to point out some key observations. So, first, uh, we observed that when the sample size is small to moderate, our non symptotic procedure of selecting the uh, tuning parameter and also, also as uh, our procedures uh, tends to be uh, much better than those asymptotic counterparts. And when the sample size is large, uh, they tend to have comparable performance. But the procedure of selecting the um, tuning parameter by cross-validation is usually suboptimal because that's uh, uh, lambda only reflects the information in the regression settings, which is again, very different from the detection um, problem.
Okay, to uh, wrap up this talk, uh, I'd like to point out some uh, future directions as well as some discussions. So from our studies, uh, we can see that uh, directly applying those constant inequalities to conduct, uh, to conduct a statistical inference uh, can, can be uh, uh, too conservative, um, but the advantage is that this procedure is valid no matter how small the sample size is. Also, uh, in some uh, situations, those non syntactic procedures may have advantage of, um, in terms of giving some particularly useful procedures in picking some uh, smoothing parameters. And as some future directions, we would also uh, like to investigate uh, some other procedures, such as non uh, such as bootstrap as a uh, non-asymptotic procedures uh, to conduct inference uh, for non-parameter models, and I would like to uh, also conduct a non-asymptotic analysis for those procedures. Also, it's worth investigating uh, some other structures, such as sparsities uh, on the final sample inference uh, in, on top of uh, non-parameter models. Okay, thank you for your attention. <laughs>